Good morning again. Man, I know every Sabbath is a high Sabbath, but this is a high Sabbath. And, uh, and I'm conscious of the time that I have left, but I, I want to I ask you something. Would, would, would you be graceful enough to give me five more minutes for my sermon? Could I get, if, if you give me five more minutes, will you raise your hand? All right, so I have five, 10, 15, 20, 30. All right, so we'd be here all day, right? Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But I do, I'll, be, I'll be courteous to you, but I also have to be courteous to God because he's given us a message today. And as I was studying for this message, I, you know, I was on the Google, and I, I learned something I, I want to share with you. As I was Googling, I, I found out that the United States, uh, United States is under an invasion. Did you know that? Yes. I mean, they, 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 this invasion is so big that it's gone into the capital. It's gone to all the, all, all the building, our businesses. It's even been able to invade our own homes. Do you know who the invaders are? Well, the invaders are these little friends called cell, cell phones. It wasn't probably what you think I was going at. But I, I started realizing, you know, everybody, everywhere you look is on their cell phone, right? And I, just for fun, I, I, went on, I went on the Google, and I Googled people on their phones. Well, and the first thing I saw was a family eating, and what are they doing? <sighs> They're on their phones. And then I, I continue looking, and the next one, I don't know, have you ever been driving and seen this on the side of the road? As you're driving, you look by, and you're, you're the person next to you is, you know, on their phone? And I hope this isn't you. I hope this isn't, you know, actually you. But when I see those people, I try to either, like, slow down or I speed up, because, I, I don't, you know, you don't know what they're going to do. But as I continue, have, have you seen, you know, maybe people in lines? You know, they're all on their phones. And I, as I saw some interesting ones as we continue. <laughs> no, but it gets better. In some countries, there are texted and no texty lanes. <laughs> so as I, as I continue looking, I saw people in the pool. What? They're swimming in their other phone. Uh, oh, I don't know. You know, in the movies, you know, they pay for a movie. You know, that's why if you ever go to a movie, you see they have all the, they have the warning before. They're like, please turn, on your cell, turn off your cell phones. But even more, I saw this one. <laughs> How would you feel about this? So we're going to sew up, but first, you know, let me text my wife back. <laughs> and the last, uh, the second to last one, I mean, look at this. It's like that romantic goodbye you see in the movies. And what is, she's on your phone. And finally, this, this is my favorite one. <laughs> At their wedding, about to get married, and they're still on their phones. You see, there's an invasion, and, it, and it's in everywhere. But there's one place that the phone has not invaded yet. You know where that is? Well, I wish I could see the church. But it's on, on, it's on the side of the deathbed. When a loved one's about to die, say it's a grandma or grandpa, nobody's on their phone. Not even the teenagers. Miracles do happen. But not even the teenagers are on their phone because everyone's leaned forward because they want to hear what their, la their loved one's last words may be. And this morning, you and I, we need to be leaning forward. We need to be taking away all distractions because Jesus has some last words for you and for me. And those last words are found in Revelation 22, verse 20. If you'll turn there with me. It's in the back of your Bible. And it's in Revelation 22, verse 20. And God's word says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Jesus' last words, the last words in my Bible that are read, is that, yes, I am coming soon. Do you believe that? Yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, my God, we praise you because we know that your Son, Jesus Christ, is coming soon. Lord, that is our hope. Lord, that's our only desire. And our prayer is that we'll be ready. 
Lord, may you hide me behind your cross this moment, and may all the glory and all the honor be unto you. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Um, so before, before we get into begin this sermon, I, I always like to get the full context. You know, like I hate when people say something, you know, they quote something, but it's out of context. You don't know. So the last words of Jesus is, I'm coming soon. But what's the context? Let's go back, turn back one page to me, with me to Revelation 22, verse 1. And as you're turning to Revelation 22, verse 1, which is hopefully just one page away, one flip of the page, before we get there, we have to take a moment and we need to go over a brief summary of what we've learned. Because if you look at it, we're, we're, at the back of the, we're at the end of the book. We've finished Revelation. But when you review what we learned, and, and I want to use the timeline that Pastor Harley always uses. Because see, we, 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 learned, we, learned some, we learned a lot. And so I want to help you know, refresh your memory. Do you, do you remember what Pastor Harley said happened over here? Sunday the Sunday law. And so that we know that, the, that, a, that a power is going to enforce the Sunday law. And then so during this time, this is going to be a time of persecution. Where seventh-day believing Christians are going to be either thrown in prison or they're going to be murdered for worshiping on the seventh day. And then do you remember what happens here? Close of probation. This is the beginning of the seven plagues where it says, let the wicked be wicked and let the righteous be righteous. So here we see that there will be no more death because the reason that the, these Seventh-day Adventist believing Christians were murdered was to be a witness to people. But now that the doors are closed, there's going to be, there's going to be no more death. And we're going to have the seven plagues. And at the end of the second plagues, the wicked are going to surround and want to destroy God's people. And right before they're about to gun down God's people, Jesus Christ, as a Redeemer and a Savior, is going to come in and he's going to save us. He's going to come in the clouds. And the, and the righteous who believe in Jesus who are dead, though they will rise first and be lifted up, then those of us who are still alive will follow afterwards. Amen. And so what happens after we're lifted up in heaven? What happens? Do you remember? We'll be with Jesus. And the Bible says we'll be with Jesus for a thousand years, which is also called the millennium. And during those thousand years, we'll be, we'll be in a process called the investigative judgment. And during this time, we will get to see the books and we will be able to be God's witnesses and saying that he is just, true, merciful, and loving. And during this time where we're in heaven, Satan's going to be bound down on this earth for a thousand years in what I like to call the ultimate timeout. But after the thousand years are over, the Bible tells us that the new Jerusalem is going to descend from heaven, filled with the righteous, and the wicked are going to be resurrected for the last time. And the devil, doing what he always does, he's going to deceive them all and say, hey, let's take the city. We can do it. So the, the wicked are going to surround the city. And it's going to look hopeless for God's people. But God's going to do what he's been doing since the very beginning. And he's going to rescue his people. And fire is going to come down out of heaven. And the wicked will be thrown in the lake of fire, which is the second death. And we learned that the second death, this hell, isn't an eternal burning. It's not eternal duration but it's an eternal result because they'll cease forever to exist. And after sin has been wiped away, God is going to create the earth anew. And then you and I will get to be in heaven or be on the new earth with God forever. And this is where we are. And this is enough anew. I'm just reviewing what we've gone through. But you know what the amazing thing is? If I was to sum up the whole book of Revelation. You go home, tell your friends, you know, if, if you don't pay attention to another word I say, just remember this. If anybody ever asks you what Revelation's about, here are two words. God wins. That's what it's about. God wins. And we get to be of God for eternity. So here we are. We're at Revelation 22, verse 1. And God's word says, Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood 
the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. When I was little, I always wondered, what, what would the tree of life taste like? <laughs> Chocolate. <laughs> well, all I know is soon and very soon when we get there, we'll all get to try it. And who knows, maybe it'll talk, taste like chocolate. But continuing God's word, it says, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face. You know how beautiful that is? Think about it. Not even Moses was able to see God's face. But when we get to heaven, we're going to get to see God face to face. And his name will be on their foreheads. We will be gods. There will be no more night. They, they will, there will be no need for it of night or of a lamp, the light or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. My friends, we can believe it. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. My friends, God shows us the future. We don't have to go to a, for, uh, to a fortune teller or a palm reader because God shows us in his Bible what's going to happen. And what's so amazing is here we see that heaven, the new earth, is real. This isn't anything make-believe. Do you believe that? Amen. Do you believe that soon and very soon? This will be our new home? Amen. I want you to look at your friend and I want you to say, this earth is not your home. You know, there's a problem in Christianity nowadays because a lot of Christians have gone into the mindset that they believe that this earth is their home. Don't believe me? Well, a lot of preachers are actually starting to preach it. And you know, I, I hear some people once called the Disney gospel, where it's warm and fuzzies, and they said that once you become a Christian, life is gonna be easy, and God's gonna give you all this wealth and riches. And I, I, I once heard this preacher, and I'm not gonna say his name, but he has a mega church in Houston. <laughs> and, um, and he's a, he's a great preacher, but I was listening to one of his sermons, and you know, I, I like his sermons, and I was listening to it, and he was talking about the Israelites, how when they were wandering around Israel, how their clothes didn't go bad. And you know, hearing that, I was like, oh, I think that's a miracle. I mean, that'd be awesome. Like, you could all, your clothes didn't go bad in the desert? Like, that, that's awesome. But as he was preaching, and this is where he lost me, he was, he was like, yeah, their clothes didn't go bad. But he said, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I could live with only one suit. He's like, God doesn't want you to have only one suit. And that's where he lost me. I can't tell you what the rest of the sermon was about. Because my friends, I respect, this, I respect this preacher a lot. He's a good man. But that's a lie. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say once you give your life to Jesus, once you start becoming a Christian, once you're baptized, that everything's going to be peachy green. Nowhere in the Bible do we find that our treasures are on this earth, but our treasures are in heaven? I once read, read a story from HMS Richard, a great preacher, and in his book, Feed My Sheep, he writes, he, he, he writes a story, he tells the story of a Baptist preacher. And this Baptist preacher, he goes to the theater he goes to, you know, the show, and it's not like the shows we're used to with a screen, but, you know, actors actually acted it out. And he comes to the show, and he sits down, he has his ticket, and he's, he's watching the show, and halfway through the show, he looks around, and he realizes the place is packed. And not just packed, but it's standing room only. There's people lined all against the walls. And as he's sitting there, he's like, wow. He's like, how do they do it? Like, I, I can't even get my church halfway full. How, how, how do they have the whole church full here? So afterwards, he goes up to the actor, one of the main actors, and you know, he shakes his hand, he says, wow, that was amazing, I really enjoyed the show, you, know, you did an awesome job. And then he asks him, what's your secret? How, how do you do this? How do you get so many people to come out to see your show? He's, and he's like, I'm a pastor, I can barely get my church halfway filled. 
And, he's, and the actor, he kind of smirks. And he looks at him, he says, you know, as actors, it's our job to make, seem, make things that are make-believe seem real. But as pastors, you make things that are real seem make-believe. My friends, there's nothing make-believe about the Bible. There's nothing make-believe about heaven or about Jesus' soon return. And my friends, our home is not on this earth, but our home is in heaven. And Jesus' promises for us will all be fulfilled in heaven. And as I was researching this, I found something really cool that really got me excited. And if you'll turn with me to Matthew 5, starting in verses 3. This is the Beatitudes. And I know most of you growing up have, have read the Beatitudes. Probably many of you have it memorized. But what I found out was that every single one of the Beatitudes is fulfilled in Revelation 21 and 22. Check this out. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Revelation 22, uh, verse 5, the last part says, and they will reign forever and ever. But you notice, it doesn't say they're going to reign forever and ever on earth. But they're going to reign forever and ever in heaven with God. And going down to Matthew 5, verse 4, it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And in Revelation 21, verse 4, it says, He, which is God, will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. My friends, every promise that God made will be fulfilled in heaven. Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. He who overcomes will, sorry, this is a typo, will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Revelation 21, uh, verse 6, and 22, verse 2. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the water of life. And then as we read just earlier, on each side of the river stood a tree of life that who knows, it might taste like chocolate. And then we have, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And in Revelation 22, 12, it says, behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. My friends, what could be more merciful? When you, when you call a police officer, say you're getting, your house is getting robbed in, do you, do you expect, you know, call them, the, all right, cool, we can be there in like two hours. Is that okay? You know, we have to take a coffee break first. You know, we, we don't, we, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. But no, 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 no. When we call them, we want, we want the police. When we call the police, we want them to be there now, right? In the same way, Jesus is saying, behold, I am coming soon. And that's the most merciful thing. But even more, he says, my reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. If you are if you're merciful, I will show you mercy. Matthew 5, 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. In Revelation 22, verse 4, it says, they will see God's face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And in Matthew 5, 9, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I'll be his God, and he will be my son. Amen. Matthew 5, 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Revelation 21, 7. He who overcomes won't hear all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. My friends, we will be able to inherit the kingdom of God. We'll get to be with God forever. And finally, blessed are those when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in earth and heaven. For in the same way they persecute the prophets before you. My friends, if when Jesus, oh wow, I'm sorry guys. My friends, thank you. My friends, when Jesus was on this earth, 
if he didn't have a big rich mansion, if he didn't, wasn't driving a Lamborghini, how can we expect when we get, how can we expect that we're going to have the same thing, that we're going to have a mansion, we're going to have a Lamborghini? Because my friends, this earth is not our home. And it's time that we start living like it. Do we take Jesus at his last words? Do we truly believe that he's coming, coming quickly? Amen. Because you see, when we get to heaven, when we get our reward, my friends, we're going to walk on gold. We're, the, the city, the New Jerusalem, is adorned with all kinds of precious stones. There's nothing on this earth that's worth dying for. There's nothing on this earth worth storing for. Because when we get to heaven, anything and everything we could ever want is there. But our reward isn't this nice stuff. Our reward is being able to see our best friend, our Savior, and our God, Amen. Jesus. But turn back with me to Revelation 22. Verse 7. And it says, Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. My friends, it's not enough just to read the Bible, but we have to do what it says. Verse 8 says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, do not do, that. Not, do, not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and the prophets and all who keep the words of this book. Worship God. My friends, throughout Revelation, there's a theme. Worship God. Are we worshiping God in everything we do? My friends, if Jesus' last words is that I am coming soon, my friends, we need to begin living like it's true. We need to begin living like we believe it. And everything we do needs to glorify God. So that if there's anything in our lives that is distracting us from God, we need to take it away. Because, my friends, this world is not our home. But let's keep reading. Verse 10, it says, Then he told me, Do not seal up the word of this prophecy or this book, because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who, is, who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. In verse 12, it says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Amen. My friends, Jesus is coming soon. And be, but before we read verse 14, I want to give you a warning. This is the verse that many people have used to prove that the Bible is wrong. And I'll show you why in a second. Because in mine, I'm reading from the NIV, it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes. Does anybody here have a King James? What does yours say? Blessed are those who keep the commandments? Hmm. I've had someone actually come up with this verse, bring it to me and say, Austin, Austin, the Bible can't be true. L look at this verse. There's keep the commandments and wash the robes. And in English, those are two totally different, right? Like you're thinking, how did they get that out of that? But we've got to remember that the Bible was written in Greek. And the, and the word, and the, the sentence for washed in their robes and for keeping his commandments sound a lot alike in Greek. Now, I don't like to use Greek that much, but I want to show you here. I want you to close your eyes with me, and I want you to hear this. Beca hear this, because this is how close they sound in Greek. The first one is, hoi plantis tostolos. And for those who do his commandments, it's hoi poiantis tos entolos. And what you have to remember is the way people, there's two ways that people copy the Bible. The first one is there'd be a group of scribes, and they'd have one person who was reading it. And as the person would read it, the scribes would copy it. So you see how close this would sound. 
So someone's like, keep his commandments or wash his robes. Uh, we're going to go with this one. But you see, there was a second way. And the second way is that they would have a parchment. So they'd have the Bible here, and they copy it. A lot like how you do in school, you know, when you're copying. And I, I want to show you something, because it, it was written in Greek. And all Greek was written in capital letters. So look at this. Work. Oh. Sorry. All right. Oh, technical difficulties. Oh, it's all good. Well, what I was going to show you, oh, there it is. Oh, thank you, guys. What I was going to show you, is this what it looks like in Greek? So can you imagine you're writing it in the lamp? It's really dim, and you have this sentence, and you've been doing this all day. I mean, you're towards the end of the book. How easy would it be to write the other? Right? And so people say, look at this. Because of this, we can't trust the Bible. Because look at this air. My friends, you can trust the Bible. Because watch, even with this air, even with this, even with this air, this typo from a human scribe, God is so powerful that he's like, oh, you messed up? That's okay. Watch this. Because even though they're two different, totally two different sentences, they had the exact same meaning. Let's think about it. Let's, critic let's think about this together. Wash your robes. You're like, wash your robes to keep the commands. That's two totally different things. Well, think about it. Wash your robes. What would, you, what would the saints wash their robes in? Water, blood, blood of the lamb? Who's the lamb? Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to wash your robes in the blood of the lamb? It means to accept him, to follow him as your Lord and Savior and say, Jesus, I accept your free gift. Take me as I am and cover me with your robe of righteousness. And so to accept this gift, you have to love him, right? And if you love Jesus, the Bible says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do you guys see that? Look how amazing this is. God's like, you know what? Even if a human scribe makes a mistake, I am so powerful, so amazing, that it doesn't matter. Because they have the exact same meaning. And my friends, here we see that there, that here we see that there's one, two groups of people. And the first one, verse 14, says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. So for those who love Jesus and keep his commandments, They'll be able to eat from the tree of life and they'll be able to go through the gates of the city. But then there's another group. Verse 15, outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexual and moral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So here we see that there's two groups of people. And as we look at this group, it's so easy to think, oh man, you know, that's, that's a small list. You know, I, I haven't murdered anybody. I don't have an idol. You know, I'm not, I'm not there. Well, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We see a longer list. And in and in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse 9, it says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual, sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And with those two lists, each and every one of us could find ourselves. And as I was reading this, I, I got to Epiphany, and, and I want to share with you, I believe that there will be drunk, drunks in heaven. I believe that there will be pedophiles. I believe that there's going to be perverts. I believe there will be murderers and criminals. But before all those labels, there will be two letters, and those two letters are EX. We'll have ex-criminals, ex-murderers, ex-perverts, ex-whatever. Because you see, continue reading, it says, 
will not inherit the kingdom of God, and that is what some of you were. My friends, praise the Lord that God's grace is enough. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. My friends, it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done. Jesus' gift is enough for you. And once you accept his gift, it will transform your life. Once you've experienced Jesus' love, it will transform who you are. It will change everything. I know some of you might be thinking, you know, right now, my sin has me in a chokehold. There's no way. I've tried over and over and over again. My friends, if that's you, call out to Jesus. Because just at the name of Jesus, the devil and the angels have to flee. But can you imagine how much stronger it must be when you have Jesus' presence with you? But you see, there's another part. Turn back with me to Revelation 22. And it says, outside are the dogs. Are the dogs. What could that be talking about? Well, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 to 22. And it says, If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and, over, and, and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the Proverbs are, are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. My friends here, this is what scares me. Is it possible we could have dogs in our church? Because what does it mean to be a dog? Well, the Bible says that someone who's been baptized is someone who knows the truth and yet turns the other way and goes back to their vomit. And I, I, I want my, I, this reminds me of my first dog. The first dog I ever had, his name was Horizon. He was about this big. He, he, was, a, he was a mutt, but he was my favorite dog ever. And I remember one morning, my, my mom and I wake up, and our dog had eaten something bad, and you know what happens. He, he threw up, not once, not twice, but four times. And so we're down there, and, and you know, my mom's like, it's your dog, and I'm like, okay. So we get, we get the spray, and we're going, and we start wiping, we clean one, and you know, it's gross. And we go up to get another one, and we look, and there, there's supposed to be three, but there's only two. And we're like, what? <laughs> Where'd the, the other one go? So, so, as we, as, so as we look over, we see there's my dog going for the second one. And he starts to lick it up and eat it. My friends, how much more is that like us? My friends, we know the truth. We know the lie. That's Jesus Christ. But yet, we still want to go back to our old lives. We want to go back to our old sins. We want to go back to living like we used to before we knew who Jesus was. But my friends, we can't. My friends, the only way to keep that from happening, to keep us from being dogs, is to continuously be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And my friends, that's why every day, we need, the first thing we wake up, we say, Jesus, I'm yours. Take me today. That's why we need to be reading our Bible every day, because the moment we get disconnected from God, the devil swoops in. When you're not protected, the devil swoops in. And he starts whispering in your ears, and he's like, hey, you see that vomit over there? You see those old sins you used to do? Man, don't they look yummy. And you know the worst thing is? We begin to think it, they are yummy. And we begin to go to the old things that we've given up. My friends, that's why every day we need to be in our Bibles. We need to be living like Jesus is coming tomorrow. Because Jesus' last words are, I am coming soon. And my friends, our lives, we need to match it. To close, I'd like you to take out your bulletins. 
And it's, I know it's a little long, but I'm closing, don't worry. I, I would like for, for us to read our, our meditation for the week, our reflection. It says, I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful and were looking to the time of refreshing and the latter rain to fit them to stand in the, in the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Oh, how many I saw in, in the time of trouble without a shelter. They had neglected the needful pre preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of the Holy God. Those who refused to be, to be hewed by the prophets and failed to be purified their souls in obeying the whole truth and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is will come up to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see that they needed to be hewed and squared for the building. But there will be no time then to do it and no mediator to plead their case before the Father. Before this time, before this time, the awful solemn decoration has gone forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. I saw that no one could share the refreshing unless they obtain the victory over every beseemment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. We should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord and be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in that day of the Lord. Let all remember that God is holy and that none but holy beings can dwell in his presence. My friends, Today is the day to prepare for Jesus' soon return. May there be nothing that keeps us apart. And may we take Jesus at his last words. So my pill for you today is a simple one. If you, my pill for you today is a simple one. If you're willing, I'd ask for you to raise your hand. And that is, if this week you'll... You'll make the stand to read your Bible every day and to pray continuously. Pray in the morning, pray at work, and let prayer be the last thing you do. Because my family, I don't want to go to heaven without you. And we all need to be working daily, making sure we are right with the Lord. So my friends, if you are willing to take my challenge, I invite you just to raise your hand, that you'll pray every day, and I should read your Bible. And with that, let's have a word of prayer. Lord my God, my Savior, my King, Lord, we know that Jesus is coming soon. And my one prayer is that each and every one of us will be ready, Lord. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for the gift of your Son. And Lord, may we walk in your grace every moment of our life. This is my prayer. In your name I pray. Amen.